what voice are you hearing? Here are some voices going through my mind right now. Man, there's a lot of them. The line at Starbucks was too long, I'm starving. Will we ever get an elevator right up to the hotel room tonight? Will we ever catch that thing? God, step into this room with me and utilize me. Make this conversation about something way bigger than myself. What voices are you hearing though? Maybe there are voices that say I don't belong. I'm not good enough. What am I doing here? I'm scared. These people are lit up. It's cold in here. It's hot in here. I'm hungry. I'm full. Here's the voice that I want you to hear during our conversation loud and clear. Mark played a video, and it was the video of a gentleman who ran a marathon, and, and he tripped on that. He tore his hamstring, and then his father comes out of the crowd. Security tried to stop him. Did you see that scene? Do you remember the guy brushing the guys away? What he kept saying is, he's my son. He's my son. And so brothers and sisters tonight, the voice I hear you, hope you are hearing loud and clear in your minds and in your hearts were spoken almost 30 years ago by that father, and they're spoken tonight by yours. She's my daughter. He's my son. And I am well pleased that he is here in San Antonio with 12,999 other awesome leaders. That's the voice I want you to hear loud and clear, my friends. But life is not always easy. The roller coaster ride that Mark talked about sometimes takes us off the rails. Have you ever done anything that looking back on it, you realize was a big mistake? Okay. One guy out of 13,000. I, I, I struggle. <laughs> I know you're all Catholics and you're really holy. I just struggle believing that. Looking back at last weekend, for some of you, did you do anything that you realize now was a big mistake? Of course, we are a broken lot. It's actually one of the things that unites us today, our brokenness, our redemption also. When I was a kid, I grew up in Missouri. If you're from Missouri, make some noise. All right, baby. I'm home. I grew up in Missouri, and I saw some kids in my neighborhood playing with fire and gasoline. I assumed if they could play with fire and gasoline, what's the next line? A little louder, please. <laughs> Woo, right on. If she can do it, so can I. So that weekend, it's on. I'm seeking the wrong thing. Come into the garage, bend down next to a can of gasoline, light a piece of cardboard on fire. It's five gallons, I bend down. The plan is to pour a little bit on top before the liquid comes out. What shows up first? The fumes. The invisible stuff. In life, and this is why faith is so valuable. In life, it's seldom what we see coming that burns us. It's the fumes. It's the invisible stuff. It's what the media doesn't talk about. It's what the guy living two doors down isn't writing about. It's the fumes in life that we today, 13,000 strong, have come to harness, come to elevate. But that day for me, age nine, the fumes came out, created a massive explosion that split the can in two, picked me up, and launched me 20 feet against the far side of the garage. When we were little, we were taught and trained what to do when we're on fire. What, what are we supposed to do? Good class. What do you actually do? <laughs> Some lady down here goes, freak out. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Because training and teaching is cheap if you don't open up your heart to it. If it's all head knowledge, college leaders, and I know we have some in high school as well, if it's all head knowledge, it's useless. Our opportunity while we celebrate Christ redemption, love, life, as we seek something bigger than ourselves, is to open up our hearts to the possibility of him moving in our lives today. You are his son, and you are his daughter. That day for me, I got scared, I panicked, I ran. It was a decision that changed my life. One moment, I'm a perfectly happy and healthy, 
And I'd like to zoom in in case you came in a little bit late. It's okay to nod your head. Extremely good looking. <laughs> okay, for nine, geez. I mean, bangs like that. Go, go look at it, dudes. I mean, that, that is either a laser level or, or what else might it be? Sorry, a freaking bowl. That's right. It's not church, you guys. You can talk, okay? That little white thing you see below his chin, what's that called? It's not a turtleneck. It's a freaking dicky. Yes, sir, that's exactly right. It is a dicky. It's the top portion of the turtleneck. It's the worst part of the turtleneck. But my life was good. I don't know what your childhood was like. Let, let me give you a quick glimpse into mine. Catholic education, six siblings, two retrievers, mom and dad, boom, married, Midwest living, church on Sundays. If we were good in mass, we got to go to pancake breakfast afterwards. Life was awesome. And then leaders, seekers, life changes. Boom, the roller coaster ride. And it's so important to hear this, this message. Listen, you remain my daughter and you remain my son. The next picture is going to be hard to look at because I wasn't hearing that voice loud and clear back then, even though it was with me. It's hard. You may want to shut your eyes for a moment. I found myself as a child, nine years old, like Steve said, with burns on 100% of my body. I'm dying. And I remember laying there on my back, looking up at the ceiling, and all I could think as a kid was, oh my gosh, my dad is what? I'm sorry, a little louder, please. That's exactly right. Your daddy's going to kill you. You ever been in trouble with your mother or your father, yes or no? I mean for having bad grades, for skipping class, for a semester. <laughs> like little things, set your parents off. Okay, try blowing up their house next week and let me know how that shakes out. My daddy's gonna kill me. That's the voice I knew was going to be coming into my life. The voice of fear. And if you listen closely to the media, it is what you will hear, my friends. But we come seeking a different voice. The voice of truth. My dad came into that room and the very first thing he said to me, this man of faith. I love you. I love you. You're my son. You're my son still. I love you. It's the voice of God. My dad changed my heart and yet the struggle forward would be difficult. After my father left and my mother left, I was left in this room by myself. Eventually, the mean doctors and nurses came in. They had to tie me down to the bed to control my contractures so I can't move. My lungs were burned <laughs> so I can't breathe. They put a hole in my neck. Seekers, what's that called? You got a trach. So now you can breathe, but you can't eat or drink. Or talk. It's like church. <laughs> you can't do nothing. <laughs> Except glorify the one who gave you life. But back then I, I could do nothing. I just laid there. I was sad and broken and so mad and so curious. Where's God for me right now? But I could occasionally think and hope and pray, and dream, and imagine. I could also hear. Growing up in St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm from, there's basically one thing that unites us. We are a town that loves Cardinal baseball. I grew up a huge Cardinal fan. Go ahead and boo if you don't like them, I don't care. Boo, I'm a Cardinal fan. And back in the 80s, the way we used to watch baseball was on the radio, and the voice that came into our lives was the voice of a Hall of Fame announcer named Jack Buck. I never met the guy. Never met him, but I loved him. Listened to him every night growing up, telling me what the Cardinals were doing. I got burned 
on a Saturday. 30 years ago, by the way, coming up, January 17th. Third, burned on a Saturday, Sunday afternoon, I am laying in darkness. I'm dying. Lights are out. And I hear the door open up. Somebody walks in. I hear a chair come across the floor. And then I hear this voice bring light into the darkness. Kid. Wake up. You are going to live. You are going to survive. Keep fighting. John O'Leary Day at the ballpark will make it all worthwhile. And then he asks, kid, are you listening? And as a nine-year-old, I remember laying there, eyes swollen shut, nodding my head. <laughs> to which he replied, good, keep fighting. Keep fighting. He leaves the room. I'm tied down in darkness by myself thinking, oh my gosh, I am on fire for life. You ever had that experience? Okay, don't be so literal, okay? <laughs> There's not gonna be a test on this later on, it's not A or B. Have you ever had a bad day, yes or no? Yeah. Oh, you have, me too. Have you ever had one roommate one friend, one fellow seeker or sojourner come into your life, say or do one thing, and your entire day changed. Ever happen? Me too. One time. January 18th, 1987, when my hero stepped into the darkness, a guy I'd never met before. He left the room. He pulled the door shut. I learned this years later from my dad. And he just started weeping, which we all know is the sign of great weakness, yes? I mean, if you're crying in every class, <laughs> maybe too much emotion, <laughs> but occasionally Christians, Catholic brothers and sisters, to follow the advice, the shortest verse in scripture, Jesus wept, Jesus wept. It's not weak, it's strong, it's faithful, it's stewardship. It's men and women who are lit up for causes greater than self. Jack wept. One of the nurses came over to him, tried to comfort him, and then told him that there was no chance the little boy is going to survive. No chance. You will get this diagnosis in your life repeatedly. No chance you'll pass that class. No chance you'll make a difference. No chance the faith is in a stronger place tomorrow than it was yesterday. No chance. What we do next, to whom we turn, will matter. What this man does in prayer, he takes it home, he cries, he prays, and he reflects on one simple question. What more can I do? What more can I do? The following day, I'm laying in darkness. The door opens up. Footsteps come in. I hear a chair get dragged across the floor. Somebody sits in it. They clear their throat, and then I hear the voice. Kid, wake up. I'm back. <laughs> you are going to live. Got it? You are going to survive. And when you get out of here, not if, we are going to celebrate. We'll call it John O'Leary Day at the ballpark. Keep fighting. If you read in the parentheses, this is what he's saying. You are my son. You are my daughter. I'm still with you on this ride. I'm still with you. Jack continued those visits, this encouragement, this shepherding. Over the next five months, he guided a little boy with no real earthly chance home faithfully. A month after homecoming, we took this thing downtown and we had a party. That's me on the left, okay. <laughs> then we took it upstairs, man, and we started the party big time. That night, that little dude put down 13 Cokes. <laughs> this is when we thought it was good to drink a lot of soda, back in the day, man. My mama was proud of me that night. <laughs> 13 Cokes, my goodness. So Jax, he's a little boy who drinks too much. 
but not with my hands because I don't have them. Everything I drank that night came through a straw. So Jack sees a little boy who can't hold anything. He sees a little boy in a wheelchair. He sees a little boy with scars from his neck to his toes missing his fingers. He sees a train wreck of a child. And he chooses not to get stuck in the brokenness. He chooses to see the other side of the equation, the side that we Catholics seek. When you see the little boy up there, go ahead and look at him. Besides the cardinal hat, what jumps off that image at you? Do you see it? The smile. Cover up the mouth, now you see it in the eyes. This little boy is lit up, lit up. The spirit is alive. Jack sees it, and he sees the brokenness. He takes it home, the good and the bad. He cries, he prays, he reflects, and then he journals on one question. What more can I do? The following day, he sends me one baseball. Below the ball was a note from Jack Buck that read, kid, if you want a second baseball, all you have to do is send a thank you letter to the guy who signed the first. Uh, just one problem, Jack. What's the problem? And don't say you're from Missouri. I don't want to hear it, okay? <laughs> Not cool. Not cool. You don't have fingers. My mom and dad have been trying to get me to write for a long time. What my mother used to do, she used to walk into my room with a little pen in her hand. She would try to hand it to me. And she would say, baby, when you learn how to write again, you get to go back to school. Does a little boy want to go back to school necessarily, yes or no? Does he want a second baseball? Oh man, bring it on. With the help of my mom and dad holding my hands together, we wrote a note to Ozzy, mailed it off, and two days later got a second baseball with a second note that read, kid, if you want a third baseball. <laughs> mom, bring me a pen. I said, now, mama. She does, now it's on. What you seek, you find. Remember that. Mail off another note, sit at home doing nothing. Then I got a third baseball with a third note that read, kid, if you want a fourth baseball. <laughs> Are you seeing where this is going? You're not. Okay. So then I got, <laughs> it's confusing. I know, it is. So then I got a fourth baseball with a fourth note that said, kid, if you want a fifth baseball. Now do you see where it's going, yes or no? Yes. Hey, in a marketplace of negativity and no's, let our Catholic yes be heard. Yes. Jack, that summer, sends a little nobody named John O'Leary 60 baseballs. 60. Teaching this little fellow how to write, which brought him back to grade school, St. Clements of Rome. That was followed by high school. Four years at DeSmet Jesuit, followed, thank you. That was followed by college, nine years at St. Louis University. <laughs> that was followed by graduation, miracles do happen. And graduation night, one of the great miracles shows up. The miracles love. I never dated in grade school, middle school, high school, or college. Never dated. But graduation night, right on time, and ladies and brothers, that's how God works. Right on time. Love shows up. Can I show you her picture? Yes or no? Yes. Here she is. Isn't she gorgeous? Who'd you expect? No, I did not say marriage. I did not say lust or a girlfriend, I said love. Love seldom looks like what we expect. It looks so unlike what we expect that we will crucify her. That's our take on love. That night though, love shows up for me in the form of a 77-year-old man named Jack Buck with Parkinson's disease like my dad has and stage four lung cancer. And yet, leaders, seekers, he showed up. He showed up with a package and a note. 
What do you think the first word on the note was? A little louder, please. Kid. I'm not sure he ever knew my first name was John, okay? <laughs> you now know more about me than he ever knew. He shows up with a package and a note. The words say, kid, this means a lot to me. I hope it means a lot to you too. Enjoy, it's yours. I open up the package, look inside, and before I show you what he gave, leaders, students, sons and daughters, you gotta first know his question. His heart on fire for causes and a spirit bigger than himself. What more can I do? What more can I do? Kid, this means a lot to me. Hope it means a lot to you too. Enjoy, it's yours. This is the baseball that I received when I went into the Hall of Fame. It's made of crystal. It's priceless. Don't drop it. <laughs> and the final words Mr. Buck ever said to me, spoke to me, or wrote to me were these. It's yours. It's yours. It's yours. What a gift. And yet it's not anywhere near the gift that you and I unwrapped about a week and a half ago. This gift that arrived in a manger in a small backwater town, Bethlehem. This gift, Christ, the word, eternal, comes into our life as a baby, lives among us, heals, meets us where we are. That is so awesome. Meets us where we are, not where he is. Near the end of his earthly life, he breaks bread with us. Something we celebrated a couple hours ago in the Eucharist. Then he gets down on his feet, he humbles himself, he washes all the feet, even Judas's. Let that blow your mind tonight. Even Judas. You can't step far enough away from him. He's going to wash your feet because you are his son. You are his daughter. Then he picks up our cross. It was ours, but he picked it up. He carries it up the hill. He dies on it for our sins. And then three days later... The light returns. Salvation, eternal life, redemption, this gift. And all we need to do for this gift is say, yes, I want it. Whatever these other people around me tonight are talking about or feeling or singing about, I want that. I want that gift. That desire to take that gift and live it out through my life has certainly changed me in all areas, including relationally. It took a while, but it was worth it. Her name is Elizabeth Grace. We met Shortly after I graduated, Beth has given me this baby, named after this man. Now we have two of them. And when I'm out of town in San Antonio, my wife thinks it's funny when she takes my little men and dresses them like this. <laughs> which is why I need to get a flight out tomorrow morning, get them back in their cardinal gear, tell them I love them, there's nothing they can do about it. Tell those two boys to love their little brother. And they just keep showing up. I'm telling you right now, be very careful. Okay, this picture on the bridge is my final pick to you tonight. I hope right now what you're seeing is less about my wife and my babies and my journey and my brokenness and my scars as much as it is a fella holding up a big mirror to 13,000 brothers and sisters saying, take a good look. This is your story. This is your race. And there is someone walking right with you, whispering the words, you are my son. You are my daughter. I'm with you. Now, before, always, always, I'm going to run this race with you. And all you got to say is yes. It's yes. It's awesome. And I hope right now you're thinking about what more you can do to become part of this message in your life and in the lives of those you serve back on campus and beyond. I always think when I hear a homily, if I can take one nugget and put it into action, it's all worthwhile. One takeaway, while you are in conference for four days in San Antonio seeking to come even closer to the one who created you, try to leave every session with one takeaway. What's yours from this? Here it is. What more can I do? How can you be a reflection of Jesus Christ for a community? Starve for it, my Catholic brothers and sisters. How many of you have a phone? Four of you. Okay. So 
For the four that have it, this is gonna take like 20 seconds. What I want you to do, grab your phone, text me your email address. This is a way we can stay in touch, but more than that, if you brothers and sisters ever need a thing, if you need us and our organization to pray for you, pray with you, lead you forward, serve you in any capacity, I'm all in. And so are we. My number is 314-202-5373. If you put in your email, I'll send a special message for you later on this week. When you get back home and the roller coaster ride gets off the tracks and it gets hard and it gets ugly, uh, I'm going to remind you that he's with you. And then he's not going anywhere. But all you need to say back in return is yes, yes, yes. So 314-202-5373, your email. If you're an overachiever, you can stay in touch through Twitter or Facebook. My mom was extraordinarily influential in my life. Uh, she still is. When I got out of the hospital, there was one good thing that happened as a result of being burned. I would never, ever again have to play the piano. <laughs> what a gift. I came home on a Saturday, and Tuesday afternoon, Mrs. Bartello comes to our house. My mom unhooks my wheelchair from the kitchen table, and she starts pushing me. And as she pushes me, I remember thinking, where are we going, Mama? She takes me into the living room, and she sits me next to Mrs. Bartello at the piano. I had just had the fingers on my left hand amputated. They were in a boxing glove. My right hand was in a splint with no fingers. And my mean mom is making me take piano class. What more can I do? That mean mom made me take piano class for the next five years. I'm going to play you a song on the piano right now. And when you hear it, don't expect perfection. But when you hear it, know that if this guy who is so broken can sit in front of this incredible piano in front of 13,000 friends and let the song be heard, what's possible in your life? Through your work, through your education, through your spirit, through your faith, what's possible in your life? It always starts slow, remember that. You are his daughter. You are his son. Seek boldly. God bless you guys.